Today, we're gonna be looking at AK Pro 4. This is now the third CPM portable machine that I have after the Jonos and the Osborne 1, uh, an original model Osborne 1 even. But this one is probably the most usable machine out of all of them uh, that I will have encountered so far. It has five and a quarter inch drives, which makes it much more normal than the Jonos. It has a, um, <clears throat> a grown-up sized display, which makes it better than the Osborne. And it also has serial and parallel ports on the back, which just makes it a lot easier to use with other devices. This does seem to work. However, um, it's, uh, it's got some reefas in it, so I wanna get those out. But what I don't know is if the floppy drives work and if it will actually boot. The only thing I've been able to make it do is turn on, put some characters on the screen, and then beep when I press any keys. However, as I was bringing it from my house to the office uh, and moving it around, I heard some things moving around in it. Now, I'm not sure what those are, uh, but I would like to know. So the first thing we're gonna do today is open this up and make sure nothing weird has fallen somewhere that it shouldn't. Now I should actually state before we get into this that this is the K-Pro 4, not to be confused with the K-Pro 4. And by that I mean four versus four, because K-Pro was really weird. Uh, so to get into this thing, we're gonna have four screws on each side and then two screws on the top and then this is a uh, metal plate that's just bent around the uh, top of the case. So kind of nice, easy to take apart. The three real connectors on the back of the machine while we're here are the uh, standard serial port here. It just doesn't have the uh, shell on the connector for grounding. And then the parallel port. And the parallel port on this is Centronics on both sides. So you need a Centronics to Centronics connector. And then the keyboard uses the handset style RJ9 connector, I believe it is, for uh, connecting to the system. All right, let's take out some screws. All right, with all of the screws out, this is the easiest thing to remove. There is our Zilog Z80. Um, so that is dated 33rd week of 1983 by the looks of it. We have a WDC floppy controller. Up here, we have um, some hot spare Z80s. What? We have Z8 420, Z8 440, and Z8 420 again. Okay. All right. So, you know, reading PIO, PIO, SIO. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So, on CPM, you'll have virtual device mappings, kind of like COM1, COM2, LPT1, LPT2, and MS DOS. Um, and you can change what those ports are used for. So for simplicity's sake, having them be the same interface would allow you to swap things around driver-wise a lot easier. So that kind of makes sense actually. So there is one thing um, that was rattling around here. This I originally saw under the CRT, so that's cool, but uh, it's a quality control sticker for the machine. So that's kind of fun to see. Let's get the CPU board out of here. So it looks like there's two screws up front that go to those ridiculously long standoffs. And then the other screws have to come out of the rear of the machine. So now we're gonna undo the power connector, which is keyed. Okay, don't have to worry about that. Good job, K-Pro. It's also labeled on the motherboard, that's nice. A another keyed connector, reset switch. Okay, but why does it have so many pins? Because it also goes to a power LED on the front. Oh my gosh, that is, <laughs> that's, they, they met the minimum requirements to make that work. Oh my gosh, is that keyed? It is, everything's keyed. And I think I feel the board is insulated on the bottom, a nice, Single side copper sheet, dude, this thing's pretty darn well made. I'm not kidding. The only thing I'm hearing is the sticker. <laughs> 
It can't just be that, can it? Yeah, the only other thing I see moving around is another sticker. Okay, well, I guess it's fine then. Uh, don't have to worry about that, <laughs> thankfully. So the only other thing I'm really concerned about is that this machine has yet another Aztec power supply, which means Rifa and potentially Rifa right there. And then I think there's one more vertical one around here somewhere. So we should get this out and pull the Rifa capacitors off of this before it blows up. Power supply out. So here we have the power supply board and we have a uh, one, two, three X class Rifa capacitors there. Um, and Rifa is just a brand name and we'll actually see that in a second on this one. So this one is coming out before it detonated, uh, unlike the one in the Apple three. So it's a little easier to see. Rifa is literally just the name of the company who made this capacitor. You're totally fine yoinking this thing out and then just chucking it away. If you can handle the noise going back into your power circuit, you don't need those capacitors. So we have two more here, uh, another X class, another X class right there. We're gonna go ahead and remove those as well. And we're not gonna replace these because they are just filter caps and they're not in the path. They are just off of the path. Again, totally fine not replacing these. If you really wanted to, you could put new filter caps in, but it's not necessary, especially with vintage equipment that you're realistically not gonna be running all the time. So with the suspicious Rifa caps removed from the power supply, we can put this back in here and then uh, get the motherboard back in and fire up the machine. There's no reason not to. I think that's it for the internal stuff. All the connectors are connected, so I can put the housing back on. That's the computer. Also, it has a nice kickstand on the bottom. <laughs> now that we have the machine put back together, inspected internally, and I have my uh, curiosity satisfied about the floppy drives, we are ready to try and power this thing up. So there is the keyboard, which this doesn't sit on, by the way, but man, that looks really good tucked up into that. Uh, the faceplate of the keyboard is a brushed metal that's tinted. This looks ridiculously good. The one thing about the keyboard that I want to criticize though is the connector for the cable on this side um, is not flush. Uh, it has a lip on it and I've definitely seen pictures of these getting sheared online. So that kind of sucks. Uh, but elsewise, it's not too bad. Not exactly sure what the intended cable routing is here, but we're gonna go through the foot and then wrap around the side um, and then plug it into the back. This is easily the worst cable solution I've seen for one of these systems. Uh, you should definitely just plug the keyboard cable in right there, not in the back, that's stupid, um, but eh. All right, I'm gonna add power and then turn it on. trying to boot, so that's a good sign, and video. All right, so if I turn off the rear lights here, see much clearer how good that looks. Now, if you just uh, ignore how reflective it is, hi, uh, there's not a lot that we can do from this point. I can make it beep by pressing keys, uh, but we need to go make a disc. Now, because this is a CPM machine, it means the disc is unique to this computer. Hopefully someone has archived it for a K-Pro 4, k 4 is pretty common, so I suspect it will be. All right, I have found a disk image that I believe will contain CPM 2.2 uh, for the k 4, uh, and we're gonna try and write it directly to a floppy disk using a grease weasel here. There we go, writing. Let's go see if this disk works. Not too confident because I'm not actually sure about the quality of this floppy disk. All right, popping in CPM, we'll see what happens. Oh, yeah! Oh, that's awesome! We have an operating system. So we can do dir. Yep, and it just listed that out anyway. Okay, so what all do we have on here? Because this is kind of important for CPM. Sysgen allows you to make new system disks. That is a super useful program to have. Bodcom, now this might actually be used for configuring the serial port. I'm gonna go ahead and run that. 
Yes, okay. So one of the critical things to note about how CPM machines work is that your loaded RAM environment will contain your configuration for say your serial port baud rate, bit length, stop bits, all that kind of stuff. Um, and you have to have machine specific. So you can see this is K-Pro baud rate adjustment program. You have to have machine specific uh, configuration utilities for this. So that is very important to get because you can, I think with a sysgen, make a disc that doesn't have all of this stuff on it. So again, very important to get a complete system image like this. Config might allow us to change the mapping for the parallel and serial ports. Let's go ahead and check that. IO byte cold boot stuff. Let's take a look at that. Um, IO byte definitions. Let's see. Yep, there we go. That's what I was talking about. So this is the virtual port mapping. Uh, so yes, uh, you should be able to set, yep, the console to TTY or CRT. Uh, so you could set your CRT printout to go to the serial port if you were using an external terminal, for example. So this is the kind of thing that really makes CPM somewhat unique. I really like this side of it. It's kind of weird and cool. But that looks like all of the uh, major system utilities that we need for the K-Pro 4 here. So uh, we have a really good system disk image to build from here. So. This should be very usable after we get a couple more discs made for it. All right, it's been a few days of work, but I now know how to make discs for the K-Pro 4 here. It is uh, a kind of weird setup, uh, and we'll go over that because we're going to use the Grease Weasel in a moment to actually make some discs, and I'll walk you through the entire process of how to do it because CPM machines are kind of a pain uh, since they're basically all different, but there are some considerations for putting software on a machine like this that I would like you to understand first. Although even before that, I should mention that uh, while I was setting up this machine, <laughs> of course I had to mention it, the keyboard connector on the back of the keyboard itself did break and I actually had to use the super glue and baking soda trick to put it back together. It was really weird because nothing hit it, it just failed. I don't actually understand why, but uh, yep. They're really brittle and fragile. Back to the thing that I want to show you first though, I want to look at WordStar. Specifically, this is WordStar 3.0 that I got as part of a set with my MSI and CompuPro 816. The only thing is though, that is an eight inch disc and it doesn't exactly fit in the drives that the K-Pro has. Now I've already ripped this floppy and it's even on archive.org if you want to take a look at it. So I have a digitized copy that I can work with to modify to get one that actually will run on this machine. Before we get into that, there is something here that I would like you to understand to know why not all software is going to work on every CPM machine perfectly. And especially this one, uh, most likely since this is the four Roman numeral 83. Now, since I have the disk in here, we can switch over to drive B and we can get a directory listing of it. And I've already set up WordStar for this machine. You run install com for this. And we will do that again in just a moment. But for right now, we're gonna run WS, which is proper WordStar. Let's go ahead and open a document and we'll try and open example.txt. So there we are, the document is open, the software is working perfectly. However, my cursor movement keys don't work. Now I can see on the left here, cursor movement is ASDF. That is holding down control and then using ASDF over here to move the cursor around. That works just fine. And this gets into one of the weird things about CPM because you can kind of consider every single CPM machine half mini computer and half terminal. All right, I've restarted here so that I can demonstrate something to explain this better, especially if we run the install program. Now this machine doesn't have a hard drive, so you might wonder, what exactly is it installing? Well, the software itself has to be installed for it to work on this computer because of how CPM functions. So we're going to tell it we want a normal first time installation, and it's going to essentially copy the WSU com file, but also modify it. And this is the biggest aspect of this for knowing how to configure your machine. Each of these that are listed here are different kinds of terminals that you could have connected to your CPM computer. 
And I'm talking literal dumb terminals like the TRS-80 DT1 that I did a video on or the Televideo 950 that's shown up in some of my streams and the Visual 200 that I did show in the lot that I got with WordStar, which not coincidentally at all, is one of the supported terminals on here. This is because each terminal around this time used different command codes for doing different things. So for example, the cursor keys on the Kpro here, it uses control HJKL for the cursor keys. Now those are escape codes, which are still in use today. Like slash R is carriage return and slash N is new line. Those are very common. And that is still the basis of how this machine works. But those escape codes were not standardized by this point. They really didn't become standardized until the DEC VT100 came out, really dominated the market. So this machine kind of has its own escape codes for the different keys that don't really match up to any one of these terminals. And when you would buy software, you would have to know that it would be compatible with the type of interfacing that you were doing with your machine. Now, in this instance, I have three menus of different terminal models, and none of them are realistically this computer. So the best option that I would have in this case where none of these are say the K pro is to actually try different ones one at a time and see which ones best match up to the keyboard that I have. Now the real answer to this problem for me, especially now, like 40 years after this machine is even relevant, is to just get a newer version of WordStar. I can probably find a newer version than 3.0 that likely supports this computer directly. So I don't need to try and figure out which terminal is the most compatible with it. I can probably just get one that's close enough. That's just the warning that I wanted to give you when it comes to putting software on a CPM machine. Now, let me show you how you actually do it. Over here at my workstation, we are going to start making an actual physical disk to put in this machine with new software. Now, I will say, if you want to use a floppy emulator like a GoTech, you totally can. And at the step where I'm writing it to the floppy, you could just convert it to an HFE and put it on here and it should work fine. But this is how I'm going to set this up for using real physical disks because that's just what I prefer. All right, now I've downloaded a bunch of CPM games that I'm going to eventually try getting all of onto here. But for right now, we're going to focus on Hitchhiker here, which is the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy game. Now, before we actually try and write that to a disk, I want to open a disk image to show you the weirdness that is K-Pro floppy disks and CPM in general. So this is a map of the data that's on the floppy disk. But the problem is we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten sectors. Now the number of sectors and other variations on the disk are gonna depend on the machine that you're running them on. For example, these Sound Blaster driver disks for an IBM PC system are gonna have nine sectors on them because that's what the PC is expecting. The K-Pro is the one that is expecting a 10 sector disk image. Now there's nothing inherently wrong with this disk structure being 10 sectors, but it does mean that it is not compatible with most of the tools you would use for writing to and from floppy disks that are just regular PC disks. This is completely different and you're gonna have to use completely different tools. Enter CPM tools, which is a set of files that allows you to do pretty much everything you need to with disk images for a CPM machine. However, that means that we need to be able to take this file, which contains both sector layout information and the raw data and convert it into just a data partition. Now, this gets a little harder because the K-Pro in this instance is weird and non-standard and kind of dumb. This is the first side of the disk. This is the second side of the disk because this is a double-sided drive. However, if we select one of the sectors on the second side, we can actually see the side ID is set to zero. It has the same side ID set on both sides of the disks. And instead of having the sector ID numbers restart on the second side, they are sequentially continuing the ones from the other side. This made working with these files a little more difficult because it meant that I had to figure out what the structure of the disks was, and how to tell the Grease Weasel to read and write disks like this. Which is where a repository of many different Grease Weasel disk format tools I've been working on comes into play, and especially this disk definitions file, which I have created a disk def for the K-Pro. More specifically, on the second side, it starts at ID 10 and head zero. 
Now, one of the reasons that I really needed the disk definition here is because I needed to be able to convert this full sector layout file that I have here. This is a TD0, which is an older, somewhat better way of ripping floppies, although it has its faults, but it's the best that was available at the time. So we need to convert this into an IMG file, because if we try to run CPMLS on this file, it has no idea what's going on in there because it doesn't understand what a TP0 is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run GW convert and give it the location of my custom KPro4 disk definition. And I'm going to take in the TD0 file and get out the boot disk as a blank IMG file. Now that I've been able to convert that, it's kind of funny because TD0 has compression and this doesn't. But if we run that same CPMLS command, but this time on our boot disk, we can see all of the files that we saw on the machine itself. Now with CPMLS, there are some more options we have. The first thing we will want to do, because we want to actually put games on the computer, is do CPMRM. And we're going to delete all of the files that are in this image so that we can use it to create our own disk. Now I should note that I'm using the KPIV format from CPM Tools because it already knew how to work with the KPRO4, saving me some time there. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to tell it to delete all files from the zero partition on the disk. And with that done, there is now nothing on there. The zero area that I'm talking about is actually related to the user IDs for the disks. This is kind of like the UID, GID for Linux, where users usually start at 1000 and go up from there. If you have multiple users on one system, they just start at zero on CPM. Now we can copy the files into there. So we're going to do CPM CP and we're keeping the disk image name here first because it always needs to know what that is. And then we're going to tell it we want to copy the pitch files that are in this directory. We're going to copy all of them here into the zero user directory again. And we now have both of those files on the disk image. And now that we have a valid image file here, I might as well rename it to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And we can write that to the floppy disk. I'm going to change the convert here to a write. And we're going to read from our Hitchhiker's image and write to drive one. And again, if you wanted to use a GoTech instead of a real disk, you could just use the convert command to convert it to a file extension ending in .hfe, and then it would work great on here. I'll also mention while this is writing that CPM is, um, did you notice CPM's weird? Uh, it keeps the BIOS on the floppy disk, and the BIOS is actually stored in the first few sectors of the disk. So technically, in a way, because we started with the system boot disk, this still has the BIOS on it, and it might be bootable, but that's not really a goal. It would be possible to make the disk bootable if we left some other files in there and have it be a usable system disk, but we're just gonna boot with the other system disk and then change to this one now that we have it. But that's it. We have Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy on here for the K-Pro 4, so let's go try it out. All right, that is a fresh boot. I'm gonna put in the Hitchhiker's disk. I'm gonna change over to the other drive and I'm gonna run hitch dot, actually I don't think I even need the dot, just hitch. There we go, we made a disc compatible with the K-Pro 4. Now if only I was compatible with this game, I can never figure out how to get out of the bedroom before the bulldozer destroys it. Let's see. Why are you so hard? Now, despite my ineptitude with it, it's still really cool to be able to see something like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy on the K-Pro 4 because I highly doubt it was ever sold for it. It's kind of amazing that there's a CPM version at all, but that's a different thing entirely. To be able to make my own version of the game that will run on that machine is really cool. And hopefully that helps explain to you how you can do that too with any software. It's the same principles. You need to get the actual application files, put them onto a blank disk image, and then write it to a floppy to use in the machine. But the key is understanding how every single CPM machine works slightly differently. <laughs> but 
I think that's it for now. We got the computer fully functional, we got software on it, and we were even able to play a game. Everything works just fine, both drives, the CRT, the screen. I haven't tested the ports on the back yet because I haven't done that on any CPM machine yet. They're a little funky to use and figuring out how to actually send data to them is something that I still need to learn more about because you have to be able to use the setting stuff. And again, that's different for every single machine. So I'll have to learn that for this one just to figure out how to even do that. So that's a future objective that I'll probably explore on another machine. But I'm very satisfied with where we're leaving the K-Pro 4 and this is probably my number one go-to CPM machine now. So I'm really excited about that because it's just an all around capable computer. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and if you did, you may want to subscribe so you'll be notified when I release more CPM machine videos or that floppy disk one. If you wanna help support the channel, you can find me on Patreon, but for now, that's it and I will see you next time.